I'm grateful to be here, and when Jeremy first reached out to ask me if I'd be interested in joining this group uh, and talking a little bit about lessons in leadership, I, I was uh, happy to agree because I have a lot of respect for Jeremy and I've watched him grow in his career and um, admire his leadership. And I um, actually have uh, learned a lot of lessons in leadership, really compacted in the last um, six, nine months or so. We've been going through a pretty significant organizational restructure at Intermountain Healthcare. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the restructure specifically and talk about the lessons that I've learned and our team has learned as we've gone through this restructure. A little bit about Intermountain Healthcare. We are a fully integrated healthcare delivery system, meaning we own hospitals, uh, we have uh, medical group clinics, we have about 2,800 licensed beds across the state of Utah and into southern Idaho. We do own our own health plan, and it has about 875,000 members, and that membership increases and decreases depending on what's going on around the community, and I'll talk a little bit about that. We also have a home care service, a hospice. We don't own skilled nursing facilities, but we've set up uh, collaborations and partnerships with our communities and so forth. This integrated structure that we have really has allowed us to serve people throughout their lives. So in the ambulatory setting, as well as the acute setting, and then back um, really towards their end of life. Uh, we have about 1,500 employed physicians, but we also work with physicians who are not employed with Intermountain Healthcare, and you can see that's about double the number of our employed group. Uh, we have about 750 advanced practice clinicians that we employ, another 1,000 or so that are affiliated uh, with us. We have almost 10,000 nurses, and we do employ a, about a third of Utah's uh, nurses. So a total of about 39,000 caregivers across Intermountain Healthcare. We are the largest private employer in the state of Utah. We do have, um, we do have competition in the state. The University of Utah is a great partner and competitor with us when it comes to healthcare services. We partner with them for a number of things as you do with the university here in providing um, medical professionals and so forth to, to, to join the team. We do research together and, and faculty, but our hospitals compete for uh, the patients that live within our communities. We um, were organized back in 1975, so we're not as old as uh, many other health systems across the country. And in 1975, the LDS Church was operating 15 hospitals in the state of Utah. And they decided they wanted to get out of the hospital operations business. And they um, came together and d decided to donate those 15 <coughs> hospitals to, and organize them to become Intermountain Healthcare, a not-for-profit organization, and gave us the charge back in that, um, that first handover to become a model healthcare system. And we've extended that to say, well, what is a model healthcare system? And that is really about being, trying to be on the forefront and not following, but really leading out and delivering extraordinary care at both a sustainable cost as well as the high quality and service that our community has come to know. I think that's really important, as, especially as we were thinking about this transformation and this organizational restructure. In order to be a model healthcare system, you have to continually transform. You have to continually update and, and change, or you will no longer be a model, right? You'll be, you'll be reactive and being trying to try to catch up. Well, so in... Um, I guess it's been a little over a year ago as we were looking at our financials and we were having actually pretty good financial times. We had a new CEO come in about uh, 18 months ago, almost two years ago, and he's, he started to drill into our financials. We've had um, actually really stellar financial, um, financial years of, over a number of years. 
um, since the, the downturn, which everybody struggled with, right? Um, and, uh, and even through that downturn, we were, we were pretty stable. We had to tighten our belts a lot through the, a couple of years, but we really have, have had been sitting in a pretty good space. We also had high quality. Our service experience scores were good. And so, you know, we're thinking we're having some good times. Um, and CEO, new CEO, you know, what, what will you bring us? Let's just keep us moving forward. Well, um, what he identified was that one of the reasons we were so successful financially is because we had a, a pretty nice payer mix, actually, in the state of Utah. And he, uh, as he looked at it, and we started to do some calculations and thought, if, we, if our payer mix was similar to a few other places, we would actually be not doing quite as great. Or if we lost some of our select health members that, uh, that were directed lives into our organization, we, we would be at risk. And then, as you know, there's been a lot going on out in the, across the country. Hel the healthcare landscape has been quite unstable. This is a, an article that came out uh, just in February of this year. You know, the days of the hospital as we know it may be numbered. And I think some people thought hospitals are going away, and I don't think that will happen. I do think we, we will need hospitals. We will always ha have the opportunity and need to think about sick care and delivering sick care. But the reality is the hospitals, as we know it today, need to change. They are, we are too expensive. We do have um, opportunities to reduce our costs. And there's a lot more that can be done out in the community, in the community settings uh, at, at a lower cost and actually be, be better. And we need to get more upstream so we don't have as many people that are actually having to come into the hospitals. So we were going through um, you know, lots of discussions in our executive leadership team. Um, modern healthcare, American healthcare has reached its tipping point. As you know, it's really looked no further for proof than insiders and outsiders who really are, are trying to link up and disrupt this cost-ridden um, industry. It, it's been, uh, as you know, pretty interesting. We've seen mergers and acquisitions like never before across the healthcare industry. I have a, a, a friend and colleague who it was, this, is this, was the CNO of a large health system. And uh, in her town, they merged with another large health system. And they did it pretty quickly. And uh, I was talking with her about that merger. And I said, what are you going to call the system? And she said, well, we haven't decided yet. You know, we're going to probably keep both names. Um, it's just there's, there's been a bit of panic and anxiety out there about how do we do this. We need to get larger so that we can have better buying power and, and uh, all sorts of things. So lots, lots going on out in the, across the nation. We use this slide, you know, there were five days in December where CVS Health and Aetna joined, right? Advocate and Aurora came together, United Healthcare and DaVita, Dignity Health, Catholic Health, Ascension and Providence St. Joseph had some, some discussions going on. We updated this slide in um, 2018, and this so far I should have taken off actually because this was just really through the end of February. Microsoft and Google announced Precision Medicine startup. The U of Penn, you know, acquires Princeton. We announced forming a generic drug company. Amazon, Berkshire, I, Hathaway. You, you've all seen all of these disruption um, layoffs in the system. January through July of 2017, there were 72 healthcare companies that had layoffs, and the first part of first quarter of this year, a number of other hospitals also announced layoffs. So a lot of change happening all around us, right? Um, these, these guys, you know, coming together, and Warren Buffett, I think, is the one credited with saying, healthcare costs are a hungry tapeworm on the economy. And I know they're still figuring out how they're going to these three groups coming together make an impact on healthcare, but because of their large employee base, that they have to cover the costs of the healthcare for those employees. 
and their um, financial dollars that they have in assets that they can help fund some, some startups and some things that they can, they can help us get so much better. Um, it'll be interesting to see what comes from this. And Jeff Bezos, um, which is one of the quotes I, I really love, it's, if you're competitor focused, you have to wait until there is a competitor doing something, meaning you, you really, you're more reactive, right? But if you're customer focused, it allows you to be more pioneering. And that's, I think, what we are, are trying to take on. And as we actually um, uh, changed our mission statement a few years ago, to a very simple, our mission is to help people live the healthiest lives possible. That is our driving force. We're trying to be more customer focused versus uh, our previous mission was about delivering health care and doing it in a high quality, low cost way, which we still will continue to do. But this is more encompassing and it's really thinking about going upstream and helping people um, think about their health as well as the downstream and managing illness and sickness in the best ways possible. At Intermountain, we've, we really have built on a strong foundation. We have a strong mission. Our, our teams are committed to our vision to be this model healthcare system and to um, deliver care in a, in a high quality, affordable way. We have a legacy of leaders who really have established a, a nice foundation for us. And we, we live our values. That's one of the things I've really appreciated uh, being at Intermountain, which I've, I've worked there my, pretty much my entire career. But when we have individuals who come in from other organizations, that's one of the first things they say is you live your values. And that's important when we think about change and transformation. Um, that was one of the things as we were going through our organizational restructure that some of our caregivers would say to us, are you living our values, right? Are you treating people with respect and, and are you being honest and have integrity? And all of these things actually get challenged when you go through change and that's um, something I learned. We have this strong foundation, but it starts to feel a little uneasy when you're changing the work and the workflows around individuals. They start to tie it back to your mission, vision, and values, and you have to think about how can we continue to make sure we're, we're always connecting it together. We've been known for our clinical excellence. Uh, we established clinical programs, and I'll talk a little bit about those um, a number of years. We have a, a team that's very innovative. We have strong, capable caregivers, and we've got a, a great leadership team. So as we contemplated this transformation, we knew we were coming from a, a place of strength and financially strong, clinically strong, um, foundationally, we, we had a, a strong organization. We also um, continually talk about our fundamentals of extraordinary care, which are safety, quality, experience, access, and stewardship in the context of our engaged caregivers. And this is how we think about um, driving our, towards our mission. So, phase one. Um, we began as an executive leadership team back in about March, March of last year, talking about the need to change our structure so that we could really deliver on our mission. And in order to do that, we recognize that, you know, we're in this we're in this place where we're trying to continue to deliver on fee for service. So you, you get paid for what you do, right? And also go up this, go down the path of um, getting good at population health and taking on risk for, a, for certain populations. And the way our organization was structured, we had five geographic regions. We had set up a leadership team in each of those five geographic regions with a region vice president, a region CFO, CNO, C CIO. C I mean, we had like replicated the central office leadership team in five different regions. And what we had identified is each of those leaders in each of those five regions took on their accountability to make sure their region was the strongest it could be, which was great. But what that did is sometimes they competed with one another. Like, you know, we are the same team here. We, we uh, should be 
working towards making Intermountain stronger and the communities across the state um, healthier when instead we were really focused on our own territory in each of these regions. And the hospital regions, or the regions were structured really by hospital. So the hospitals were focused on hospital care. Our medical group clinics actually had nine regions, so they weren't even lined up um, with our hospital regions. So you can see we had, um, we had created these um, mini intermountain units across, uh, across our state and into Idaho. Well, I have, um, I have a daughter who was a nurse at Intermountain. This is my daughter, Christina. She uh, went to school at uh, Brigham Young University in Provo, and she did a capstone experience in our hospital at Utah Valley in their neonatal ICU. That's where she really wanted to work. She wanted to be a NICU nurse. And so she spent um, three, three months in that NICU learning a lot and realizing, I love the NICU area. Well, her husband was, um, he got accepted to finish out his MBA uh, at the University of Utah. So they decided to transfer up to Salt Lake and she got a job right out of school at Primary Children's Hospital in their NICU. So Primary Children's is one of our hospitals. And she went to work there. And it wasn't long she, after she started working there, she called me and she's like, it's interesting, there are different protocols in these two NICUs at Intermountain. And I said, well, it's probably, you know, primary is a quaternary and it's a level four nursery and they're, well, no, mom. I mean, there are things that we could be doing the same that we're doing different. And I said, okay, good information, Christina. She, she loves, so I have uh, four children. They've all gone into medicine and when they've worked at Intermountain, they've let me know all the things that we have opportunities to improve. <laughs> which I really appreciate. Uh, I, do, I do love my children and their willingness to share <laughs> openly. Uh, um, so after about a year at Primary Children's, she, uh, they ended up, her and her husband, buying a home in um, Draper. And so the commute was getting a little bit too long and so she transferred to our Intermountain Medical Center, which is in Murray, Utah, a little closer to home. She was working night shifts so that the commute was, was a little more um, tolerable and uh, she went to work at Intermountain Medical Center in their NICU and said I can't believe three NICUs now and just such a, such a difference in the way um, some things are practiced here aren't we one Intermountain and we actually had begun to use that term one Intermountain we need to our patients need to expect the same high quality of care in each of our our facilities and some of, these, some of these protocols were not um, significant, but when you think about staff that cross and patients that might interact with, I mean, it was literally, even the way we interacted with our patients were, and, and the mothers in these NICUs, what we would tell them about their discharge and how they were transitioning home was inconsistent between these three places. So our, one of our goals was really to create this um, this one Intermountain um, experience for those that we serve. We came up with a set of guiding principles, um, which uh, I won't read all of these. This is our set. I did try to bold some of the things that we really wanted to focus on. Safety was a high priority. Affordability was incredibly um, important to us. High quality uh, and consistent care with seamless transitions. We were getting a lot of feedback about how difficult our system was to work with, how hard it was to get into a provider, how um, confusing it was sometimes to figure out you know, our, our um, instructions and, and so forth. So we decided we really wanted to think about how we could better support the patient journey through, through their life um, and their health uh, needs and experiences. And so these, again, we, it really boils down to a consistent, extraordinary experience whenever, wherever, however they need us. So this isn't just about getting care in the hospital. This is about getting care in a clinic. It's about getting care from my phone or um, wherever I am, I, I'm able to access uh, a provider. So we, um, as I mentioned back in April, we started talking about how, how do we do this? 
and there were uh, about four or five of us from the executive leadership team that came together. Our chief operating officer, myself, our chief medical officer, our chief people officer, and then our chief um, uh, communications officer. And we began to um, brainstorm about what, what it is we need. And we ended up landing on this over our overall structure. It does look a little bit like a jukebox. There's, it's been called a number of things, but it, and so we tried to change it and we decided, no, but it really tells the story, so we'll leave it as it is. But what we, what we all agreed was that the cornerstone and really the top of whatever structure we put in place, we need to be thinking about the people in our communities, what it is they need, how they need us to show up, and so forth. And we also recognized that we needed to be focused on specialty-based care, so what happens in the hospital, and we needed to also think about the community-based care. So let me just, just, and the last I'll mention is strategy, that the executive leadership team really owned the strategy. So as I mentioned, we had these five geographic regions. Every one of those region vice presidents owned the strategy for their region, and we've said, you know, we've got we've to have an intermountain um, strategic plan. So with this structure, we eliminated the five regions, which meant we eliminated the five region leadership teams. Now these were senior leaders. Many of them had been with Intermountain Healthcare for a, quite a while. And when I, so we eliminated those positions. That was one of the first, um, I think, opportunities for lessons learned. We talked a lot about, we had a meeting in October that was on the books, had been on the books for about nine months, our routine senior leadership meeting. And we pushed ourselves to be able to have this structure ready so that we could announce it at that meeting. And what we didn't want to do was to announce it at that meeting and have the leaders that were impacted sitting in the room and wondering about what, what the impact, you know, how that was going to impact them. And so as we put this together, one of the things we did over the two weeks prior to this meeting was meet individually with those people who were personally impacted. We were able to have a conversation with them about what we were doing, how we were um, planning to go forward, what it meant to them personally. And there were a few of them that we knew we would have other positions for them, and some of them we didn't. And that was really helpful, so that when they were in the audience and we, we shared this structure and they were able to talk with their teams afterwards, um, they were able to be supportive of this new structure going forward. In the meeting that we had in October, we spent the majority of the time on the why we were making this change and where we were going. And the where we were going really excited people the why we were making this change resonated with our, our leadership. And that was actually a pretty positive meeting, um, which we were, we were a little bit worried about. But we had prepared, really well prepared the why. Healthcare's changing. We need to change so that we aren't changed by someone else, right? So we decided we needed to make some changes and do it from the inside out versus having to respond to these external forces. Um, when our select health, health plan um, actually lost membership because Aetna came in last year and offered the product, their product, at a, a lower price, it really impacted a number of our hospitals and the volumes decreased and it, we felt it. I mean, we financially took a hit because of just that shift in um, uh, losing a few um, employers from Select Health over to Aetna because Aetna directed their patients to uh, other health systems. So we, we recognize that it's really um, tenuous. Our payer, uh, I understand you've got a pretty good, uh, you, you see a lot of Medicare and Medicaid, but there's a lot of different um, payments that come because of that population and because of where we are today. And we recognized ourselves that we cannot continue to count on the same types of, of income and the, and the revenues that we were getting before. So, and 
we also recognize our goal was to help people live the healthiest lives possible, which isn't all about sick care. It's also about um, getting upstream and, and helping them become more healthy. So we went through this, this leadership meeting. We actually surveyed our leaders prior, uh, after the meeting and incredible amount of energy and, and positivity. And what I learned from that was, you know, if you, if you really um, have a, a great rationale for why you're moving forward and you've got leaders, they're smart people and they, they really understand it, um, they, they can take it in a positive way. What happened over the course of the next several weeks was now people started thinking, oh, what does that mean for me? Um, be, beyond those individuals that we had shared that impact with. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So on the community-based side, we asked them really to, to focus on population health. And their goal was to um, focus on how to reduce our per member per month costs. And on the specialty side, continue, I mean, we still will have some of our population and our risk um, payments on the, the specialty side. But their um, primary responsibility after safety, quality, and experience, I, I want to make sure y'all know that's still top priority, is to, to really um, manage episodic care and to focus on reducing our cost per case where we have that opportunity. Um, the other thing we did with this structure is we lined up um, our clinicians. So you can see that the, the leadership, we formed a triad over community-based and a triad over specialty-based operators, nursing, and physicians, a triad leadership. And we lined all our nurses up through nursing, our physicians up through um, the medical leadership line, and the operators up through operations. Sounds pretty clean and simple, but there's like as you know, a lot more to that, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. We knew that we needed to form this clinically integrated network and make sure that through this restructure, we weren't disenfranchising some of the affiliate providers that we had partnered with and, and been so successful with over time. And so this structure is, is really important. And you can see our medical group sits here and the affiliated network. Our medical group had become a group that was pretty isolated from the rest of the organization. And as they hired their physicians in, um, they had a long history of the kinds of things that they would do for providers. It had become very provider-centric versus patient-centric and, and really um, not integrated with the rest of the system. And so we, we wanted to keep the medical group and, and improve that and build on that um, affiliated network. Within our organization, we felt like we had the skills and the talent and the capabilities for the specialty-based side. We hired, actually, Joe Mott um, has been in our organization for about 30 years or so as well, but we, we've had one leader turnover since we announced the structure. Steve Smoot was who we hired um, initially in October to fill this role. He's actually since taken a position at SSM Health up in St. Louis, so you all may, you may get to know Steve Smoot, is a great guy. Um, Joe Mott is uh, the Associate Chief Operating Officer for Specialty-Based Care. Lisa Graydon is um, our CNO for Specialty-Based Care. She's been with Intermountain a number of years. Paul Krakowitz is our um, chief medical officer, and he also was, came from within Intermountain. Hadn't been here long, actually came from the Cleveland Clinic before now. So those were positions we were able to fill from those uh, leaders that we, uh, where we eliminated positions. Terry Kane also um, was a strong leader within Intermountain Healthcare, and we hired her to, to lead our clinical programs and our shared clinical services. She um, was a re one of the region vice presidents whose position was eliminated. We did not feel we had the talent and the skills and the capabilities to manage population health and, pop and risk internally. And so we went on a national search to fill the three um, triad roles, and I'll talk about those in just a few minutes. Which, uh, one, again, one of the lessons through change, we debated a lot in our executive leadership team whether we should announce these as appointments 
you know, we, we, rather than post them and fill these positions on the left-hand side, even though we knew who we wanted to fill those positions, we thought going into this leadership team, is it better to just say positions have been eliminated, we're posting, or is it better to appoint if we really know who we want to fill in those positions? And we chose to go ahead and appoint these individuals and make that announcement at our senior leadership position. And that actually gave people a lot of comfort knowing, okay, we've eliminated these positions and now we actually do, will continue to have some stability in our leadership team and we know these people and we're confident that they'll be successful going forward. It also allowed us to have a little bit of a jump start on the specialty side as they began to do their redesign, which was phase two. So once we announced this um, major reorganization, the elimination of the regions, and moving more towards a one inner mountain, we began this um, second phase of our design. And each of those leaders, and each leader over a number of functional areas, we asked them to take on the assignment to redesign each of their um, specific areas. These were our design objectives, and I won't, again, read through each of these. But what I will say um, that you don't see on that list is cut staff by 10% or reduce by a certain number of dollars. We intentionally, we felt like we needed to, to gain some efficiencies through this process, but we also didn't want to, to um, say everybody has to cut by 10% because we recognize there's more opportunity in some areas, less opportunity in others. And we wanted to give our teams that opportunity to really go through detail by detail um, their organizational structure and say, if you were to start with a clean slate designing for the patient, what would your organizational structure look like? And um, we, we knew that we would have a matrix leadership model. One of our key messages was to simplify the leadership structures. We found in some of our functional areas, we had as many as 15 layers to the CEO. So from the frontline staff member to the CEO, there were 15 different leaders. Um, and it, that's a little bit difficult to get messages from top to bottom and bottom to top. And I hate to say top and bottom, but as you, you know what I mean. The, from the front line um, to the CEO when there is an important message to be delivered. So we, we felt like simplifying leadership structures was really important. We also felt like it was important to establish clear accountability. That was something we had heard before. Um, we had medical directors that didn't really know. They said, I have five different medical directors I have to report to, so who do I take direction from? And this was one of our guiding principles and design objectives. Let's get really crisp and clear on who has accountability for what piece, reducing these hierarchies and so forth. Also looking at spans of control. We had a number of directors who had no direct reports and same with some of our managers. So it was an opportunity to really take a deep dive into the organization and, and understand where we had opportunity, where we could eliminate redundancies, where we could fill gaps that we might um, not have noticed if we hadn't, hadn't done this work. We had two teams um, that had already started down a path because we had hired new leaders before the announcement. They had already started thinking about how they wanted to redesign their group. So we said, well, why don't you, you guys go first? And that was our care transformation team, which is this, essentially our clinical information systems, and then our, our quality and patient safety. So they were going down the path, and they got started and were doing this work. And they were, we were moving fast. Lots of things were happening. And what we recognized was there wasn't a consistent process for the way we would approach these designs now for these functional areas. And the communication was happening. Um, so a hospital administrator may learn from his own, one of their own um, team members that some, some, um, individuals that used to report there now are reporting somewhere else and uh, you know, it was a little, a little bit challenging. So what we learned was we needed to make sure we were being really clear and that, our, that we were structuring for success. 
So we put together a couple of teams and templates for our functional teams to use as they went through the redesign process. And we had some very specific expectations for each of them. We formed this um, tiger team. You all have tiger teams here. Just, just got that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the trans our transformation teams where we pulled in a continuous improvement leader, HR, a change management leader, communications, et cetera. So they all, and they came, we took them out of their departments and promised them that they would still have a job when we were done with this organization's restructure, which was really important because otherwise, I'm not sure we would have gotten the, um, through this change, we would have gotten the buy-in for them to come to this team and work for a year, is what we said, it'd be about a year, to help um, all of our functional teams through this redesign process. Our Aligning for Clarity team was a five-member team. So myself, our C COO, CMO, um, communications, and HR uh, came together, and we read every one of these design templates because we wanted to make sure that we weren't creating redundancies, that we were eliminating in the right places. And um, it, it was actually a lot of work. Was the other thing when I said we ought to be involved in this <laughs> it's like yeah it was a lot of involvement but it was really important so that we had consistency in the way that these redesign processes were happening and we would not allow communication to the employees that were being impacted without checking off all of the steps and making sure that um, communication plans were clear, that the HR processes had been attended to, that all of this work um, came together and we were consistent in the way we were making our decisions. The Structuring for Success Committee was a broader, a broader group who had a chance to see the final drafts of these um, organizational redesigns before we communicated more broadly to the organization and that was, that was really important too because they had the opportunity to push back and give feedback um, before that actually went out. This was hard work, um, and I'll just mention on the community-based side, as I mentioned, we did not have the leaders there internally. We did go ahead and recruit externally, and it took us a little bit longer to begin to build this out. So these three came from different places across the country, bringing different skill sets, and um, actually, our last one just arri arrived just about a month ago, and they're, they're now beginning their process on the community-based side. So this has been a journey. Um, and I've, This is the, the community-based team, the, the kind of the area of focus that they're working on. And I'd, I don't think I'm going to go into all of these details unless you're interested in seeing wh where we came, came up with. I will make a couple of comments. So our, our, our community-based care is really looking at, you know, how do we manage the health of populations and what are the tools and what are the, what's the infrastructure that we need for population health. In specialty-based, we're looking at mostly hospital operations and we redesigned and this is, doesn't look too dissimilar from what you're doing today as far as the service lines go. But what we've done is we've put a leader for the system in each one of these service lines. They also have operational accountability for the facility that they're residing in. And we have them spread across Intermountain. So we've got a triad here, an ops leader, a, a nurse leader, and a physician leader. And they may or may not sit in the same place because we wanted this distributed model so that we can make sure we have consistency um, and reduce that variation across the, the system. And they get to know our teams all across the organization. My first slide, I said we had 22 hospitals. This says 23. We are opening a new hospital here shortly, so that's um, why there's a discrepancy. Our clinical programs has, has, have been a foundational aspect of Intermountain Healthcare for a number of years, uh, one of the things I get pretty excited about. Our clinical programs, um, we've had 10, and they, you could think of them as service lines, but this is another group. Um, each of these uh, clinical programs had leadership at the central office, 
and a very small team, so a director, medical director, data team, and their job was really to garner, um, pull teams together and develop and deploy best practices across the organization, and which they've done uh, really beautifully, the development. The deployment's been difficult because of our organizational structure. When you've got these regions that have their own priorities, it's been hard to get these things implemented. So with our clinical programs, again, we said we've got to operationalize for best patient care and um, think about working across the continuum. So our clinical programs are another group that we did have to make some changes to. We still have 10 clinical programs, but we did eliminate a couple of clinical programs, move them into the operational space. And then we've shifted and we've said some of these clinical programs sit more with the community-based team and some more on the specialty side. And so the leadership will flow up through um, the, the leadership triads on each of those sides. Shared clinical services, each of these um, shared clinical services went through functional redesign processes as well as our shared support services. We also um, talked about partnerships. When do we partner with, uh, and you may have heard outsourcing is another term for partnerships, right? Um, we didn't want to consider it as an outsource because you don't ever really give it away if the service is still being delivered in your facilities. This is a partnership. And we did make the decision to partner with R1 for our revenue cycle. And we were doing this through this transformation process. We learned some great lessons through that process. Our team had been working with R1 for quite some time. We had not communicated internally um, with the team members in the SCO about this conversation because we didn't know for sure if we were going to sign the deal till towards the end put together a beautiful communication plan. We made a lot of decisions um, and pushed R1 to accept these decisions, like we want you to take every one of these employees if they want to move over, which R1 agreed to. We want you to pay them at least the rate they're making in our organization. We want you to base, uh, a, have a site in the state of Utah so that we can have economic growth for our, our community. These employees want to keep select help, their health plan, as they move over. So we had, we had a number of things like that, and we want the date to be after April 1st, not because it's April Fool's Day, but because that was the date um, these employees would receive their annual increase, and we wanted them to get their increase before they went over. So we had done a lot. Um, we want some of our leadership to sit on you know, your your committees and teams, and we want your leadership on our team. So uh, really trying to build this partnership. We got to that agreement. We got ready and um, set up a meeting with all of our R1 managers at 7 a.m. and then the employees at 8 a.m. Well, that was Mountain Standard Time. The announcement actually went out at 7 a.m. on Eastern Time. and. So the, some of our managers came to the meeting already knowing that it happened, and that was really unfortunate for us. And that was, uh, so we ended up having to do a lot of backtracking. And once we were able to um, really get with the employees individually, that there was a lot of acceptance, and 95% and of the employees took positions within um, R1 and so forth. And it's, it's um, turning to, to be positive, but you know, again, as you think about lessons learned, you, there are just some things that you can anticipate, I suppose, but you should, probably should have a backup plan in case something, something happens. Although, as we thought through this, we, we maybe should have had the, and this, this had to do with, um, you know, it's a publicly traded company and we couldn't announce until a certain time and uh, um, all those things. And they, our leaders understood, but they, they were really disappointed that it was announced nationally before um, they got to hear about it. We've also been working with DXC, another partnership, and DXC um, does IT. We've been talking with DXC for about uh, a year or so on a potential partnership. That, um, and again, try to keep it pretty close to the vest during the conversations. 
somehow it leaked to our IT employees. And for the past year, we've been losing IT employees because they were worried that this was all going to get outsourced, that they wouldn't have a job, yada, yada. Um, so with R1, we had 2,500 employees transfer over. With um, DXC, we ended up only transferring 90 of our um, over uh, several hundred IT employees. And um, so it was really unfortunate because the IT team was in uh, a really bad state for, for a number of months because they had heard this information we couldn't share because we were under an NDA, right? And so they didn't know, they were very unsure about what, what their um, position was going to be at Intermountain, and we actually didn't know for sure either until we got to the end. So one of our lessons here is, you know, we've got, you've got to really be careful about these conversations. We were having a conversation with another organization and lab services as a potential partnership. We ended up deciding not to go down that path. And so, and in fact, probably 10 others that we chose not to. It's really disruptive for your employees if they think you're going to do something and um, you don't know. I mean, it's that fear of unknown. I think that's one of the things I learned through this process is the fear of the unknown is actually worse than the known in the end, oftentimes. And trying to, again, stand on your values and your, your, um, the foundation that you've built. Be out there, a lot of face time. So as, we, as I think about the, lesson lear the lessons learned, um, just a few highlights. I think the most difficult time to change is when things are going well. Because people ask, why, are, why do we have to change? Why are we going through this? The most important time to change is when things are going well because you've really got a, a nice, solid foundation. I, it has been a real challenging year at Intermountain Healthcare. We have really um, uh, changed things up, and it, but we are in, I can tell you, we are in a really good place right now. We have actually eliminated a number of positions. Most of those have been through attrition because as a leadership team, we chose to hold on a lot of positions rather than, than post them. And so they were vacant, and as we've gone through the restructure, we've been able to move, move people around, and there's, there have, haven't been as many losses. But, um, and again, as we talked about, uh, we did not give our teams uh, targets, but our teams um, were pretty committed to doing the right thing, and they came in with reductions in their, in their A4Cs with the Aligning for Clarity documents. We were really careful not to impact frontline staff. Um, other than these couple of partnerships I talked about, it was mostly leadership levels that we were, we were um, looking to, to reduce and streamline. A really important lesson learned is this intellectual acceptance and the emotional acceptance don't actually happen at the same time. And we've seen that come to fruition. The intellectual acceptance happens really early. I mean, we're, we're smart, we get it. But in our hearts, it takes a little bit of time to process. And we need to give people that time. Um, we need to, uh, I also learned it's, it takes courage to, say, to stay the course. You know, we could have said, ah, we got all these people upset, let's pull back, let's, you know, Let's stop, but um, it's really important to stay the course. And we will hit a little bit of a low, as, uh, or maybe a, a big low, depending on the changes that you need to make. But it's important to stay the course when you think about where it is you're trying to get to. This, um, this bullet here, people care and they're willing to do about anything when they know you, you care about them. We had a lot of change happening really fast, and it was very difficult to get out and have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. We'd meet in big groups and, and so forth, which was good. Any time I was able to get with small groups of people and answer questions, the, the anxiety levels just went down. And you all know this. I mean, communication is critical, and you have to communicate, communicate, communicate. It also, and it's not just by email, it's not just a one-time one big um, gathering, it's, it's constant. You know, I've, I've probably met with more people and more groups in the last nine months um, than I 
typically do in, in a period of time. We're continuing to keep the work going. Um, and that's, uh, I guess my last bullet would be transformation is a process. It's not an event and it does take time. But you have to have a clear, a clear um, target of where you're heading and the path to get there isn't always clear. You may have to take a, a curvy path to get there, but it, uh, it, is a, it is a process. And even today, we're recognizing there's a few changes in the decisions that we previously made that will probably need modification as our, our teams have come together. We've had, we have 45 different functional teams that we're going through processes of redesign. Um, 43 of those 45 are complete and are now um, being in the process of being launched. And uh, those last two should be, you know, our community team, as I said, is just um, on board. But by July, we should have um, most of them, most of them completed and are moving forward. So with that, I'll just uh, open up for any questions or feedback for me. I know you've got some, something you could, yes. Kim, great conversation. Um, I heard three levels of physician relationships within the organization, medical group, affiliated network, and clinically integrated network. <laughs> I heard three different, I heard three different. I don't know if it's on. <laughs> Singer of Ronald Reagan. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Uh -huh. I heard three different levels of physician relationships within the organization. One is the medical group, which I think we probably understand, but then affiliated network or physicians and then clinically integrated network physicians. Can you describe the differences between those two in particular? Clinically and uh, affiliate? affiliate. Yeah. It's, it's essentially the same. So the clinically integrated network in, is all of our affiliate providers as well as all of our employed providers. And the way we've organized is um, really by clinical specialty. So our we, as we reorganized our clinical programs, our clinical programs in the 10, the 10 clinical programs we had covered about 80% of our specialists. And they were both employed and affiliate, and they've always been that way. So our clinical program medical director doesn't have to be a, a medical group employed doc. It could be an affiliate um, provider. In most cases, they are employed with Intermountain. But the clinical care delivery is through our clinically integrated network will flow up through those clinical program leaders. And the way we've redesigned is to cover now 99% of the specialties that are out there. Does that make sense? So as a medical director, I have responsibility for the clinical care delivery for all the, the patient diagnoses and so forth in my, net, in my network. Our community-based um, le triad leadership will be responsible for essentially for the ambulatory and bringing them together as a physician and provider group, but they'll also have a home in their specialty. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for question. Jonathan. Okay. What he doesn't know is I really like karaoke. Thanks a lot. This has really been helpful. Yeah. Um, so I've had the privilege of working in two gigantic organizations, uh, Mayo Clinic uh, and IU Health, which are, I think, similarly would be, would feel very, very similar. Yeah. And, and honestly, <laughs> Uh, in both organizations, uh, there was such a bureaucracy and such a 17 pocket vetoes on uh, decision making. So if you have a, if, if, if within those 23 hospitals that you described there, A, what's the role of the leadership team in those individual hospitals? And do you think that th there's less or more bureaucracy in this world? And I'm assuming you're gonna say less. Yeah, my hope is there's less, um, and uh, so the, re the role of the leadership at the local level, um, thank you for asking that question. It was something I, I was thinking about. One of the, the other lessons we learned is we quickly got to the local boards, the governing boards, because this is big for them. We had support from our parent board. 
But our local leaders, um, the administrator for the hospital, we've given them accountability to make sure that their hospital, the safety, quality, experience, access, stewardship, all of those things still, um, you know, they're as, as good as ever, right? So they are responsible for that, even though they may not have direct line accountability for that. But what we did is we took away that um, region level, and so the hospital administrator now reports directly to Joe Mott, at the, who was on the left-hand side. So he has all of the hospitals, every hospital administrator reporting to him. So that's what we've done is we've eliminated that layer of, actually it was pretty bureaucratic, I would say, right, Jeremy? <laughs> Jeremy worked in it. Kind of difficult to get through. In fact, the leader we had originally hired for the hospital, Steve Smoot, who's now headed to SSM Health, um, he brought, uh, shared an experience where I had brought um, a, a program to the RVPs, our region vice presidents, to make a decision about uh, whether we could fund this program or not. Had a great business case, um, a really sound clinical in, uh, application. Took it to the five RVPs for their approval. And it was, you know, they all had questions and, well, we can't do it, nah, 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 and um, it didn't go. And he said, I remember coming out of that meeting thinking to myself, wow, we make things difficult to actually get through, right? So that was, that was one of the reasons we removed yeah, that. A big part of the reason why I'm asking that, I really do believe one of our strengths uh, is that we are uh, more agile and less bureaucratic. And if you have an idea in this room, in general, we are about one-eighth the size of BJC, uh, and uh, compared to our other competitors, we're much more uh, able to make much more quick decisions. Tom Tassone over there, the guy that asked about the physician affiliations, mm -hmm. he's able to make decisions much more quickly. And I just, uh, that's something I, I think all large organizations, and as we grow larger, we need to be uh, clear that we're not becoming bureaucratic too well. So. Yeah, so I think your, your question on the why will it be less is we've removed a number of leadership levels, yeah, right? That was, that was a good example. Yeah. That's another question. Hi, um, so Kim, one of the things, that, so you have a lot of managers and a lot of supervisors. You have a lot of managers and supervisors um, in this room. How did you engage them or what, is there any other advice you would give them in whether it's lessons about organizational change or, or other that you felt like was really effective in, in, in the managers you engaged here in delivering the message. Because that's, that may be, my assumption is you probably had months and months of discussion around these changes, yeah. and then when it gets to the director or the manager or the supervisor level, it, it may be a week or, or less to say, hey, we're, we're gonna do that. How do you? How did you engage them, or what lessons can you teach us about that? Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest challenges, and I, I think about that a lot. When we are making a, a big change and have big decisions to make, we oftentimes spend a lot of time at getting to that decision, and then we come out and announce it, and you're like, well, why, did you, why are you doing it that way? And you haven't had as much time at the manager level to be engaged and under, even fully understanding. So. Um, that we've, we've had pretty detailed communication plans through each of these. And I, I think the main thing, again, is um, making sure we have the why first before the change. Here's, and so we spent a lot of time across the organization and actually um, didn't include the managers in a lot of the decision making at the functional team level because those were more, again, at the system level. But as much as possible, I'm one, I think as much, as soon as you can bring in uh, managers, even frontline in, in a lot of these decisions, it goes so much better. So the more you can engage the people that are going to be um, actually operationalizing whatever decision uh, important. We did have a big leadership meeting. We invited um, it's over 600, maybe 700 leaders, clinical, all our clinical leaders, physicians, uh, nurses, pharmacists, et cetera, and uh, spend a lot of time here a few months back going over it and talking about what we did know and what we were still developing. And I think as much as we can say, here's what we know, here's what we don't know yet, and here's what we're still working on, 
it's helpful because when you, when you don't know what's going on, you can really make up your own story, right? <laughs> so at least if you know there is work going on, here's where we are, here's what we've decided, here's what we haven't decided, and uh, the work yet to be done. Transparency is really important when, when you get to the point you can. So, yeah. All right, thank you, Kim. We really appreciate your time. And so if you'll join me, thank you, Kim. Thanks.